This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Oceans make up 99% of living space on planet Earth. Today we hear from the scientists who study deep sea creatures that make and re-emit light. Coming up, we'll learn more about biofluorescence and how a particular glowing gene from a type of jellyfish has led to advances in studying human genetics today. A Vanderbilt University biologist will also join us to explain how his lab is taking proteins from fireflies to better understand circadian rhythm. But first, what is bioluminescence? And why is this such a common trait among many sea creatures? In studio with me today is Dr. Mark Zimmer, professor of chemistry at Connecticut College in New London, author of several books, including Illuminating Disease and Introduction to Green Fluorescent Proteins. Uh, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. I asked a question about bioluminescence. Can you briefly describe this for us? If it's any animal, living animal, that's giving off light to attract prey, to scare away something, or to find food, communicate with other species. Um, on land, we're familiar with lightning bugs or fireflies, uh, but actually a lot of creatures in our oceans um, use this or have this chemical reaction in them. Can you describe why? Well, the deeper you go, the less light you get. And then the most best way of communicating is by light. If you think about it, if you've got a firefly in a full field, far away, during the day you can't see it, but at night, that tiny little flash, which only comes from about a quarter of its body, and we can see it very, very clearly. The same as stars. We can't see stars in the sky right now, but at night, as soon as it's dark, we can see the light. And so it's a very efficient way of communicating or finding things. Now, someone who knows what it's like to be deep in the ocean um, is on the phone with us, Dr. Edie Witter, CEO and Senior Scientist of the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. Uh, Edie, welcome to the show. It's very nice to be here. You're a deep sea biologist, so when you go down there in these robotic vehicles called submersible, what's that like? Oh, it's just about the best light show you can ever imagine. My favorite place to be is 3,000 feet in the ocean near the end of a dive when we turn out the lights and we're going to be coming up and just seeing these explosions of living light all around the submersible. It's spectacular. I was talking with Mark in studio about uh, the, the many creatures that uh, are luminescent. Um, why is this and how many are we talking about? In the ocean, you're talking about trillions and trillions and trillions. It's, it's just an absolutely astonishing number. The most uh, abundant vertebrate on the planet is a little fish that makes light. And it's everywhere in the ocean because it's so vital for their survival, for helping them, as um, uh, Mark said, find food, attract mates, and defend against predators. Uh, when we talk about these uh, sea creatures that glow, um, describe that for us. You were talking about what it's like to be down in the submersible, but when you're talking about glowing, what are you seeing exactly? So most of it is blue. Um, that's the color that travels best through seawater. Um, and so animals have evolved the color that's going to um, travel furthest. But it actually can come in all colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And so there are rare instances of other colors. But most of the time in the submersible, what I'm seeing is, is explosions of blue light. And sometimes they're just flashes, almost like a firefly flashes. But other times they really are explosions of um, the release of bioluminescent chemicals into the water, sometimes as what looks like smoke, um, sometimes as particles. And uh, sometimes, you know, we'll see very clear outlines of jellyfish, um, there are these super long chains of a uh, kind of jellyfish called siphonophores that can be meters and meters long, and sometimes that will we'll catch one on the, um, the submersible, and it arches in front of the sphere and forms this parabola of light glowing that looks like um, Japanese lanterns, and then it will break and flutter in the current. It's, it, it's just incredible. Uh, in your research, can we find out a little bit more about why these animals at different points are using this light? So one of the most common reasons for using it is camouflage. 
uh, as you um, indicated in your opening, uh, you know, we're talking about most of the biosphere on the planet, well over 99% of the living space on the planet is the open ocean environment. And this is a place where there's no hiding places. There's no trees or bushes or hidey holes. And yet animals have to play all the same games of hide-and-seek that they do on land. Predators need to be able to sneak up and prey, and more importantly, prey need to be able to hide from predators. And so as the ocean filled up with swifter and nastier predators, the only place to hide was to go deeper where it's dark. And so a lot of animals started to migrate into the dark depths. Trouble is, all the food's at the surface where photosynthesis occurs. And so a lot of these animals spend their lives going between the surface at night when it's safe to feed and then hiding in the dark depths during the day. And in order to be able to avoid um, being seen, they camouflage their silhouettes. So they produce light from their bellies that exactly matches the color and the intensity of sunlight penetrating from the surface. So if a cloud goes over the sun and dims the sunlight, they dim their belly lights. And it's it's spectacular. It's the perfect cloaking device. We heard from Mark earlier talking a little bit about fireflies. Uh, this is one of the few terrestrial uh, uh, animals that actually can glow. And is that because we have this natural light, this ambient light, that, and more places to hide um, on land? That's right. Um, presumably, as animals evolved out of the ocean and onto land, um, they uh, many of the early inhabitants didn't weren't luminescent, um, and even if they were, they didn't have the need for it, and so uh, there were plenty of hiding places on land, and so there hasn't been anywhere near the selective pressure that there is in the ocean to develop this uh, enhanced form of visual communication. Uh, I'm speaking with Dr. Edie Witter, CEO and Senior Scientist of the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. I should mention you're also a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient uh, back in 2006. As we learn about bioluminescence and why so many uh, sea creatures, uh, more than three quarters, um, actually are able to use light that they create themselves uh, deep in the ocean. In studio with me, Dr. Mark Zimmer, professor of chemistry at Connecticut College in New London and author of several books, including Illuminating Disease and Introduction to green fluorescent proteins. And when we think about going someplace uh, very dark, uh, very deep in the ocean, uh, Edie, uh, I guess our inclination is to put on uh, bright lights, but that actually would, I, from I understand from your research, you found that doing that actually scares away these animals. You found a way to bring them to your submersible. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, so uh, the first time I went in, down in a submersible and turned out the lights and just saw how much light there was being made down there, I really wanted to understand better what it was being used for and what it was communicating. And so over the years, I've tried to imitate some of those displays to see who might respond to it. And I quickly realized that um, you had to be pretty sophisticated about this because the animals are easily spooked. Uh, and so I needed to be able to see without being seen, um, and uh, so I used a, a red light that they couldn't see to be able to see them, and then imitated certain displays, and I found one in particular uh, that imitated a certain type of bioluminescent jellyfish seemed especially attractive to squid, and in fact so attractive that we eventually were able to use that uh, imitation um, jellyfish, electronic jellyfish as we called it, to attract the, the first giant squid ever caught on film in its natural habitat. I remember here reading about that, but I think it was in 2013, 2012, 2013. What was that like to see this giant squid? Explain to our listeners how big we're talking and how it looked different compared to, say, a, a giant squid that may have washed up uh, and fishermen may have found it. Well, uh, this was not one of the bigger ones. Um, had it uh, had its feeding tentacles fully extended, it would have been as tall as a two-story house. But um, giant squid have been found as tall as a four-story house. An awful lot of that is these super long tentacles that they have. Um, but the thing that was most surprising about this was its color. Because when we see them washed up on beaches, they tend to be brownish-reddish color. Um, and uh, an awful lot of squid that I've seen from submersibles actually have that reddish tinge because it's a type of camouflage in the deep sea. But uh, the giant squid had this amazing bronze, 
silver color. It would switch back and forth b- between bronze and silver, and it looked like it was carved from metal. It was incredible. And then this enormous eye, the size of a soccer ball, looking at you, w- with you couldn't help feel some intelligence. Um, it was it was pretty amazing. A highlight of your career? Oh, I can't say that, but <laughs> <laughs> one of them anyway. <laughs> Uh, because we're talking and we're learning about bioluminescence uh, and how it's used in the ocean, uh, Edie, I'm curious when we when we think about um, our changing climate and pollution, you know, how is this uh, bioluminescence research being used to track that? Well, actually, I'm using it right now. Um, I started a not-for-profit um, kind of with a feeling that it was time to give back to the ocean, and I was so dismayed that we seem to be destroying it before we even know what's in it. And uh, we were looking at uh, the impact of pollution on estuaries, which are kind of the the nursery for the ocean. So they're super important, even though they're actually quite small in area. Um, and I was looking for some way to, to look for toxins in the environment and trying to find what's called a, a broad-spectrum bioassay, um, something that would be sensitive to all kinds of different toxins. And turns out bioluminescent bacteria were the perfect solution. Um, and so we adapted an assay that already existed uh, that's been around for a while for testing for toxins in food, but we adapted it for um, testing for toxins in sediment. And now we use it to create pollution maps that look very much like weather maps where red is hot and blue is cold, only red is toxic and blue is non-toxic. And it saves us tremendous amounts of time and money in terms of trying to locate um, sites that we need to focus our attention on. That's really interesting, uh, Dr. Mark Zimmer. I mean, what's your reaction to this? The using these bioluminescent um, bacteria to help figure out where pollution is? Uh, it, it's a great use of natural resources and, and something that we're doing more and more. Uh, later on, I guess we'll talk about the fluorescent proteins and how they can be used. And it's a very similar idea of m- making nature work for you. How far have we come um, using this type of research? I know I mentioned you're, you've written several books. Um, you talk about the, the first people who noticed uh, uh, this this uh, chemical reaction in uh, organisms. Oh, so we've come a long way. and We understand the chemistry of what's happening and how the light is produced. Uh, and then now we're being able to use it. The fluorescent proteins are probably used in labs, probably thousands of labs every day. Uh, uh, there are companies, many companies that make them and sell them. Uh, you can buy different colors of fluorescent proteins to use them in medical research, biological research. And we'll be talking about that later in the show, as you mentioned. Um, Edie, uh, before we go, again, you have founded this organization, o- Ocean Research and Conservation Association. You were talking a little bit about some of the work you're doing, including these p- pollution maps. Um, when you look at the ocean and human impact, are you concerned about these bioluminescent, bioluminescent environments at risk? I'm particularly concerned about what's been happening to the bottom of the ocean, um, I, because I'm one of the few people that's gotten to see it with my own eyes. Uh, you know, people are aware of what's happening to rainforests, these incredible biologically diverse areas that are being stripped um, off the planet. But the same thing is happening on the bottom of the ocean. There are these beautiful, exquisite underwater gardens, many of them filled with things that look like tall bushes that are actually octocorals that glow. I mean, there there's beautiful living light on the bottom of the ocean, too. And some of these take literally thousands of years to grow, and they're being wiped out for one haul of bottom fish or bottom shrimp. Um, These bottom trawlers just strip the bottom of the ocean. It's completely unsustainable. It's stupid because it's not going to be able to support life again for for just one haul. So that really distresses me. Uh, how do you get the word out about that danger, as you said, because not many people are able to, to see that for themselves? People are trying. I mean, you know, there are these um, fish watch cards that people can carry so that they know what they should or shouldn't eat. Um, and, uh, you know, there are efforts to create marine protected areas, which I think are essential to sustaining the um, life of the ocean. Um, but it's about awareness, so um, your program today is a step in the right direction. 
Well, I want to thank Dr. Edie Witter, a biologist, CEO, and senior scientist of the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. Uh, we're going to tweet out a link to one of your TED Talks, uh, Edie. I understand you describe yourself as a bioluminescence junkie, so we appreciate you coming on today to describe this phenomenon uh, to us as well. Thank you so much. Very happy to do it. Thank you, Lucy. In studio with me is Dr. Mark Zimmer, a chemistry professor at Connecticut College. He's going to stay with us as we continue to talk about bioluminescence. And coming up, we're also going to learn about biofluorescence. How does the study of organisms that produce or re-emit light help scientists better understand what's going on inside of cells, including our own? We'll find out after the break. And we're going to take your calls, too, 860-275-7266. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Today we're learning about why living organisms make and re-emit light. Research into this common trait, especially among animals in the sea, is helping scientists understand human biology. In studio with me, Dr. Mark Zimmer, professor of chemistry at Connecticut College in New London, author of several books, including Illuminating Disease and Introduction to Green Fluorescent Proteins. Uh, we're going to learn about what green fluorescent proteins are in, in just a little bit, Mark. Um, but because we were talking about luminescence uh, in the ocean and then fireflies on land, um, how is it different, the, the way they, they make this light? So many of the um, organisms in the ocean are using the light to disguise themselves. The fireflies, I mean, we see them all the time. It's a big beacon. It's like saying, here, come and catch me. And it's only the males that are flying. They're sending a signal to the female. And the female sits hiding at the bottom. And when she sees a male she likes, she'll send a signal, come and hear the signal, and the male will fly down. Um, if you next spring catch a firefly, shake it, You'll have caught the male because that's really the only one you see. And then lick your hand. It'll taste disgusting. <laughs> and it turns out the males make this well, lucifagin, it's called. Mm -hmm. And it, it, so bats don't catch them and birds don't catch them. Uh, there's one species of firefly where the female, once she's attracted a male, will attract a male of a different species. And then she'll eat him, spit out everything but this repellent. And she's the only female species, if you catch the female, who can also give this oozy, disgusting smell or tasting stuff. And that also protects uh, her eggs? It protects her from being eaten because she does have to flash a light very briefly. Uh, and so nobody really knew why she ate the male because while they're in the flying stage, um, they don't eat. And so why would she actually attract a male from another species and eat that male. And it turns out it's just to get this repellent to defend herself. Speaking of fireflies, our next guest uh, does research uh, using uh, this protein from fireflies. Dr. Carl Johnson, professor of biological sciences at Vanderbilt University. Uh, Carl, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me on. So we were talking about sea creatures that are bioluminescent, and you actually focus on a gene the, in the firefly in the work that you're doing in your lab. Why use these firefly proteins? Well, let me first just respond to something that Dr. Witter was talking about. I thought she get, had a great segment uh, a moment ago, and as she was talking about all the bioluminescence down in the bottom of the ocean, it reminded me of the scene in the movie Avatar where there's where they're out at night and there's all these glowing organisms and whatnot and I think people think that's just fantasy land but actually it's it's down there in the bottom of the ocean uh, as Dr. Witter explained that all that kind of beautiful bioluminescence is a real thing it's not a fantasy thing mm. so as she was mentioning there's actually a lot of different organisms that bioluminesce there's fireflies um, there's also uh, a number of jellyfish different types of jellyfishes and uh, bacteria and Many of the genes that uh, are responsible for this glow called uh, luciferase, the genes that make the, this protein called luciferase, have been uh, isolated, and we can now use them in applications. And that's what you're doing in your lab. You're studying circadian rhythm. Uh, tell us about it. Sure. Well, uh, first, let me just say that, that one of the major applications of using luciferase is has been as a way to assess uh, expression of genes, what we call gene expression, when genes get turned on, when they get turned off. Um, and by having a, a gene from another organism like the luciferases from bioluminescent creatures, we can then assess in another organism like human cells 
whether a gene's been turned on and off just by whether the cells start glowing or not. And so this is what we call making a transgenic organism. We take a gene from one organism and put it into a different organism. So we uh, have been able to clone, many different laboratories have been able to clone the genes that encode these luciferase proteins that create light in the bioluminescent organisms. And then these genes have been able to be put into other organisms such as human cells uh, under the control of genetic elements that allow us to know when these genes would normally get turned on and off. And so now they become a way of visualizing or reporting uh, when genes get turned on and off. And so that's probably most familiar to people in the case of, for example, a tumor cell. When uh, a cancer happens, some genes get turned on, some genes get turned off, and uh, it's possible to put a luciferase gene into a cancer cell and see when the cell becomes cancerous, it turns on and then the uh, cell begins, becomes luminescent. Uh, so that's kind of a, a turn on that is a, it's kind of like a signposting or a spotlight in a certain kind of cell that this cell's gone bad and we're using the luciferase as a reporter to, to see that as a label. But it, it turns out that uh, gene expression is very dynamic, and genes are getting turned on and off all the time. There's a temporal aspect to that, such as in your stomach, genes are getting turned on when you eat a meal and things like that. And so it's also possible to use luciferases to see changes in gene expression, not just to turn on, but turning on and off. So that's how people that work on biological clocks, like me, have been able to really take advantage of the luciferases that bioluminescent organisms make because as the clock turns genes on and turns genes off we can by a number of genetic tricks make it turn on and off the luciferase gene that we insert and that way the cells start to glow rhythmically okay and that now, dramatically that, that dramatically ahead, changed uh, how you were doing research before you had to stay up but all hours of the day to get your research done that's absolutely right. Thank you for saying that, Lucy, because when I was a graduate student 30 years ago, if we wanted to measure uh, a, a biological clock phenomenon, you know, I remember staying up uh, for three days in a row and taking time points every two or three hours, and it was very grueling. And we could only do a few samples. Um, nowadays, with the luciferase reporter that comes from the bioluminescent organism, we can automate the system by using a very sensitive camera or a very sensitive light meter type apparatus. And we can be looking at thousands of, of, of cells, thousands of organisms at the same time uh, simultaneously. So that's why it's been so useful in the case of looking at biological clocks. So let me just mention why biological clocks are important. So the technical term for them is circadian rhythms and they are controlling uh, our daily activities. Uh, they regulate our sleep. Um, and there's a lot of different kinds of disruptions that happen in modern day life, such as shift work or jet lag or a phenomenon called social jet lag. Social jet lag is something that's probably familiar to many of us that, that get up on time to go to work or school during the week, but on the weekends we sleep really late and then go to bed late. So that every Monday morning we're really kind of in a jet lag situation. So this the term has been coined social jet lag, and these kind of disruptions put us at a significantly higher risk for obesity, diabetes, heart attacks, some kinds of cancers, gastrointestinal problems, and cause a lot of sleep disorders. And that's because we have this biological clock that's regulating our sleep, it's regulating our athletic performance, it's regulating our mental performance. Um, and if we're not optimally phased with our daily cycle, then uh, these kind of uh, deleterious health effects occur. So uh, the, the phenomenon is important, it's pheno important for health and th this sort of thing. How would we try to get it? Well, one of the things that scientists are trying to do is to try to identify different kind of pharmaceutical treatments that might help people that are shift workers or with jet lag or social jet lag. And that means screening uh, hundreds of thousands of chemical compounds as potential drugs. So that's where the luciferase reporter comes in very handy. It would not have been possible 30 years ago to have done this because, again, people like me as a graduate student just can't do thousands and thousands and thousands of samples uh, for three, four, three or four days continuously. So... 
what's been possible to do is to take human cells, uh, insert a luciferase gene coming from a bioluminescent organism such as a firefly, and have that luciferase controlled rhythmically by the biological clock so that we see these cells now become glowing rhythmically. We can assess the, how the clock is running by this bioluminescent reporter, and then we can uh, dispense these cells out into many different kind of test tube equivalents and measure the glow of thousands of them at a, at a, at a given time, and so we can test hundreds of thousands of different drugs over the space of a few months, which is what a big pharmaceutical company or a other kind of a chemical screening facility uh, needs to do in order to assess whether certain uh, compounds might act as drugs that might be useful in treating biological clock disorders. I'm speaking with Dr. Carl Johnson, professor of biological sciences at Vanderbilt University. We're learning about how uh, he uses bioluminescence uh, research in his lab uh, to study circadian rhythm. In studio with me, Dr. Mark Zimmer, professor of chemistry at Connecticut College in New London. Um, we're talking about bioluminescence. There's also biofluorescence. You primarily study biofluorescent proteins. Tell us the difference between luminescence and fluorescence. So luminescence, if you had a dark room and you have, for example, a firefly, you can obviously see it. If something's biofluorescent, you wouldn't see it. it, it fluorescence is when you shine a light on something, it absorbs that light and then gives you back a light of a different color with less energy. And typically, as Edie said right in the beginning, in the ocean, blue light travels the furthest. So most organisms that are fluorescent from the ocean, if you shine a blue light on them, they'll give you back a color like green. Mm. And so that's biofluorescence. Uh, we can't see it. Uh, we typically need glasses on, so we don't see the blue light because that would be too bright. Um, but fish only see a small part of the colors that we do. Uh, and so they can actually see fluorescence. Um, we, for example, can't see infrared or ultraviolet, but a mantis shrimp can see ultraviolet, infrared, and visible light. So we can all see different colors. Well, we heard Carl Johnson talking about the importance of this research, especially in, in medical um, advances. Talk of us through when the green fluorescent protein was discovered. This was something uh, that led to uh, the 2008 Nobel Prize in chemistry, a very big deal uh, in the research and science community. Uh, what exactly is it and how it was discovered? So it was discovered by a Japanese researcher, Osama Shimomura, um, while he was at Princeton, who was trying to figure out how jellyfish, a certain type of jellyfish called Aquora Victoria, gives off light and it gives off green pinpricks of light. Um, and everybody thought it would be luciferase, which we've been hearing about, the most common way of making light. Um, but he had to catch about a million jellyfish, took him about 30 years, and he figured out that the jellyfish had something like luciferase that made blue light. But then there was something that sucked up all this blue light and immediately gave it off as green light. And it was called green fluorescent protein. And so um, he was just interested in figuring this out. He didn't want to use it or anything like that. There was another scientist, Doug Prasher. He thought, wow, you know, we could take this gene, this recipe, to make this green fluorescent protein, and we could stick it at the end of any other recipe. So you can think of it as having a recipe for a cake, and you sneak on the, the extra icing recipe. So whenever somebody makes a cake, there's a bit of extra icing. Yeah, whenever a protein's made, there's like a little light bulb at the end of it, and you can see where it goes. And he proposed to do this with cancer. So one of the problems with the cancerous growth, the tumor, is you actually need to cut it out, do a biopsy, look under a microscope, and then you can tell, is it a cancer or not? And in a mouse or in a person, you can't see if the cancer moves around, but if you made it fluorescent, so you shine a light on it and then it gave off green light, you could see where it moves. And so he proposed to do that. And um, he caught 70,000 jellyfish, um, found the recipe, the gene, how to make it, um, made it in bacteria, but it didn't glow. And he, he gave up. And not surprisingly, because if a protein is just um, a bunch of amino acids, and they have to fold in a certain way. You can think of it as a sentence. If you read a sentence, um, it doesn't magically fold into something and light up. And it's the same in proteins. There was no protein known that would 
fold itself and then light up. So pressure gave up. Um, Marty Chelfi at uh, Columbia read this paper, had a student, and tried to do it himself with, with a student. And, but there'd been a new technique called PCR. They did it, and it lit up. And so now there were numerous uses. Um, there's a ca- company called Anti-Cancer Inc. that's using Prash's original idea. They take human cancers, genetically modify them so they glow green, put them into a mouse, and then you can shine a blue light on, on this mouse, and you can see a single cancer cell anywhere in the mouse. So if it's a breast cancer, one cell breaks away, goes into the lymphatic system or the blood system, you can track this single cancer cell, see does it stop and grow and cause a new tumor somewhere, or does it just die? Mm. And you can track all of this in real time. So it's become incredibly useful. And then there was somebody called Roger Chen who came up with the idea of, well, let's make find different colors, uh, red ones, uh, blue ones. And so you can do this in two ways. You can go into um, a submersible and try and find fluorescent organisms that give off red fluorescence, or you can go into the lab and change the one you have to give different colors. And we now have a whole rainbow of colors. So these green fluorescent proteins are a real powerful tool to see the inner workings of a cell. Yeah, you you can now see when something's made inside a living cell, where it moves to and how much of it is made. You can also change the fluorescent protein so it only lights up under certain conditions. Edie Woodard had spoken about bacteria that light up with certain toxins. You can now make fluorescent proteins that only light up with one toxin, DDT or something like that. Or you can make some that light up in the presence of calcium. When your neuron fires, your brain cells fire, um, there's an increase of calcium, a hundredfold increase. So you can now genetically modify a mouse, uh, put this green fluorescent protein with a calcium sensor in the brain cells, and when the brain cells fire, they light up. So now you can see which brain cells are responsible for storing a memory, from taking a memory out, and what goes wrong. You can actually train a rat to go down a maze. When it sees a certain sign, it'll turn left. Sees a different sign, it turns right. You can see the the brain flash when it remembers this, and then you can see it putting it in the wrong place in about 4% of the times. And then you know when it gets to the end of the maze, it's going to turn the wrong way. And something we never could see before and never knew about before. I want to turn back to Dr. Carl Johnson, professor of biological sciences at Vanderbilt University. Um, can we talk about some of the, the future research that you're working on using bioluminescent sensors? We were hearing about green fluorescent proteins, but I know because you use uh, primarily the luminescent uh, proteins, how that's being used um, in, uh, to, to, to learn more about brain cells. Oh, well, thank you. Um, well, actually, Dr. Zimmer was doing a great job there, and I really uh, appreciate uh, him mentioning those things. And I also want to emphasize that the work that's going on in my lab, there's many laboratories that are taking advantage of, of these different approaches, and I think it's all really terrific. Um, one of the things that we're doing in my lab that's not directly related to the biological clock is something that Dr. Zimmer also just mentioned, that is to tr- create luminescent proteins that now respond to calcium, to do exactly what he was just talking about, to look at neural activity now in a very fast time span of millisecond signaling. So I mentioned before using luciferase reporters for gene expression, there are things that may take hours but are, are temporarily changing. But we're also trying to uh, uh, modify luciferase proteins to be sensitive to calcium or to voltage so that we can see electrical signaling in the brain. And I think this has tremendous potential because it can also be coupled with another phenomenon that's coming, which might be a great subject for another show, and that is optogenetics, which is using proteins that are, respond to light to actually open channels, and this is uh, in, in, the, in the nervous system. And this is something that neurobiologists now are, are taking advantage of to actually control neural activity, and this is something that will probably also be clinically very relevant. That's funny uh, you uh, brought that up, uh, Carl. Uh, Mark Zimmer, that's your future book coming out soon on yeah, opogenetics. I have a Mark, book. Terrific. <laughs> for young adults. Well, Mark, we, we should get together and talk sometime. 
but anyway, obviously we have a lot of very common interests. And so these are all, this is all a very hot area of research, both uh, controlling uh, neural activity and brain activity using light, but also recording it and monitoring using either luciferases or the green fluorescent protein that Dr. Zimmer was talking about. So I think all of this is just a terrific example of how studying really phenomenally interesting biological phenomena, as Dr. Witter was talking about, uh, bioluminescence is just fascinating, how it's studying those phenomena which not, at least at the beginning, weren't obviously of clinical um, importance can be translated then into discoveries that help uh, human health and medicine. And so uh, the basic research aspect of all of these different things has been a tremendous uh, benefit in terms of the kinds of things that we're going to be able to do clinically uh, in human health down the road. Carl Johnson is Professor of Biological Sciences at Vanderbilt University. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Dr. Mark Zimmer is here, too, a chemistry professor at Connecticut College, author of Illuminating Disease, and Introduction to Green Fluorescent Proteins. Today we're learning about bioluminescence and biofluorescence. After the break, Dr. Zimmer will give us more examples of how the use of glowing proteins is advancing medical research in several fields. He'll also introduce us to Edgar. He glows, but not like Rudolph. We'll explain coming up, and we'll take your phone calls, too. 860 Five seven two six six. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up tomorrow, the holiday season is the perfect time to kick back and get lost in a new podcast or two or three or four. But how do you decide what to listen to? On the next Where We Live, the Big Listens, Lauren Ober will join us to share some of her recommendations. And we want to hear from you, too. What's on your podcast playlist? That's tomorrow on Where We Live. Now, today we're diving into science on the show. Have you heard about bioluminescence or biofluorescence before? You've seen it in nature. Think about about the lightning bugs, the fireflies you've seen glowing in the summer night, or if you've vacationed off Vieques in Puerto Rico and have seen the bioluminescent bay glow due to tiny sea organisms making their own light. In studio with me is Dr. Mark Zimmer, professor of chemistry at Connecticut College in New London. And I wanted to actually take a call. Um, someone has a question about uh, what I just mentioned about Vieques. Mary from Hebron. Mary, go ahead with your question or comment. Yes, I have a question about how the bioluminescent bay or swamp survived, and if it did survive, the uh, recent hurricanes and other environmental problems in Vieques, Puerto Rico. That's a great question. Uh, before we find out if they survived, what is it about the bioluminescent bay? What's glowing in there, Mark? So there are these tiny little diatoms. They're um, called dinoflagellates. Uh, they have die two flagellate tails, two tails, and um, during the day they photosynthesize, but at night, if you touch their tail, they light up. Um, in Puerto Rico, in the Bayo Bay, they're about 700,000 to a million in a gallon of water, and uh, touching them lights them up, so a fish comes in, it lights up around the fish, and then the fish gets a fright and will swim away. So it's a protective measure. Um, they're about eight to 10 bio bays in the world. The number's decreasing pretty rapidly, mainly because tourists go, um, they wear a lot of bug spray, mm. uh, a lot of sunscreen, and then put their hands in the water. It's really pretty. You move your hands every time it touches. It's like a pinprick of light. And you can lift your hand, and if you look up in your arm, it'll be like stars in your arm because you can see these individual dinoflagellates lighting up. Uh, the reason they're in these bays is the temperatures exactly right? So they have to have a very narrow entrance, have to be about um, four to 10 feet, no deeper than that. And mangroves around help as well. So if any of this changed during the hurricane, then there would be a problem. Um, if the entrance, and the entrance in the Mosquito Bay in Vieques is quite a long one, if that hasn't changed, then the bay is probably actually doing better now without all the tourists and will recover well. I know the Bay in Fajardo has been doing really badly for the last two years, and this is probably just what it needed. <laughs> Unfortunately, the people in Puerto Rico not, mm -hmm. but... 
Uh, we were talking about bioluminescence and how Carl from Vanderbilt is using it in his lab to understand uh, circadian rhythms. Um, but what are some other ways that bioluminescence has been used? In your book, uh, uh, Bioluminescence, Nature and Science at Work, you talk about ATP testing. Uh, tell us what that is specifically and how it's helping uh, researchers in their labs. So ATP is your body's source of energy. Everything we eat at some point will get converted to ATP, and then we can use it for energy. Your brain gets its energy from ATP. Uh, we make probably about a quarter of our body weight in, of ATP every day. Um, all living organisms have ATP. So it's really a way of figuring out, is something alive? If it makes ATP or has had ATP, it's alive. Um, and the firefly luciferase um, needs something called luciferin and ATP. So if you ha have no ATP, it won't glow. So you can now have a test for life. You can have like an earbud, and inside the beer earbud, it's saturated with luciferase, and you s push it along a, a surface. If there's anything that had ATP, it would glow. So Coca-Cola and abattoirs and people like this, they use this for a test, are there any bacteria on the surface? Is the surface contaminated? Uh, before this test, you used to have to actually take a swab, grow it on a Petri dish. This took days. And then you'd know, oh, yeah, it's contaminated. On the Mars rover, there was a luciferase test for ATP uh, to see, is there life on Mars? It didn't light up. Uh, earlier, you talked a little bit about how the green fluorescent proteins being used in labs uh, to advance medical research. There was something uh, that I'd heard you speak about in a, in a TED talk about um, uh, pregnancy and women that are at risk for heart attacks. Uh, that's really fascinating. Can you walk us through briefly? Um, so if somebody has a heart attack, um, the heart gets depleted of oxygen, the muscles die. Uh, and if the person survives the heart attack... Uh, those muscles never recover. In a zebrafish, they recover, but not in humans, except in pregnant women. Pregnant women have a heart attack, and it's more common than we would think, um, survive, they will recover. And so what's happening here? So Hina Chowdhury is a cardiologist at Mount Sinai. She had this crazy idea that if somebody has a heart attack, a distress message is sent out. Basically says to the body, help, I've had a heart attack, um, the molecule that's sent out, but there's nothing in the body that can help. In a pregnant woman, that message goes out, goes across the umbilical cord to the fetus. And now the fetus has embryonic stem cells, and they're released in response to this molecule. They go into the bloodstream, which will go to the heart, uh, where this molecule, this distress signal comes from, and they'll fix the heart muscles. So how do you prove this? Well, Hina had this really simple experiment. She took a female mouse, a normal female mouse, so nothing in the female mouse glows, and a male where every single cell is fluorescent, like Edgar, who we'll talk about later, mate the two of them, and half the offspring will be fluorescent and half won't. You can actually point a flashlight, a blue flashlight, at a female st stomach, and you will see um, like little jelly beans, half of the offspring glowing. If she has a normal pregnancy, and can look at the female, there'll be nothing in the female glowing. However, if you induce a heart attack while she's pregnant, and she survives that heart attack, and then look for fluorescence, the only place you'll find the fluorescence is in the heart, and in the heart muscles. And so the only way that could have possibly have happened is if these cells came from the embryo. And they didn't go anywhere else. They only went to the distressed muscles that needed to be fixed. Wow. And so that was a very, very simple experiment and a very, very cool idea. Now, you mentioned Edgar. I don't want to run out of time. Uh, he is an example of a transgenic organism that produces GFP. Tell us who Edgar is. He's an axolotl. Uh, or Spell that for us. <laughs> oh, A X O T L. Uh oh, we <laughs> stopped <laughs> <that>. <laughs> Yeah, I need a piece of paper. So he is a, actually a salamander from Mexico. Yes, they are two 
lakes uh, outside Mexico City. There are probably a thousand to two thousand left in nature, so they're on the border of being naturally extinct. But in the labs, they they really easy to keep. Um, it's a salamander that's stuck in its larval stage. So normally salamanders go from eggs to larva to adults. Edgar is about 12 years old. He's a grumpy old man. Um, but he's stuck in the larval stage. He's sexually mature. Um, but what that means is also he's incredibly re regenerative. Um, if you look at Edgar's toes, um, some months he'll have six toes, some five. Um, if you were to cut off his leg, he'd be able to regrow it. If you cut off his optic cord, he'd be blind for a couple of weeks and then would be able to regrow his optic cord. So he's very interesting because of that. And so he's been genetically modified. So every single cell glows green. Um, I just use him to take to high schools and schools and show kids. But you could, in theory, take stem cells from him, implant them into a salamander, if they differentiate and become something new, like cone cells in the eye or skin cells, if they came from Edgar, they'd glow green. And so you'd know where they came from. And I've read that this um, use of the axolotl, um, looking at limb regeneration to help uh, with amputees. Right, because he's so regenerative. That's, it's called field of cell development. There are many, many people really interested in this. So axolotl spelled A-X-O-L-O-T-L. -O -O and if you want to see Edgar right after the show, if you look for where we live on Facebook, we'll have a Facebook Live uh, with Dr. Mark Zimmer and our producer, Carmen Baskoff, uh, to, to learn a little bit more about uh, Edgar and the very important research that's being done. Now, we talked about how valuable this is in modern biology. Challenges in getting research, uh, especially from the federal government, to keep this kind of research going. So to me, to me, the important thing is the basic research question that we've come to. Um, Osama Shimomura got funding to find out why the jellyfish gave off light. In, in today's climate, uh, he probably wouldn't have got that money because there was no end result, no practical use for it. There are probably thousands of organisms in the oceans that have very, very useful proteins that we can use. For example, optogenetics, that protein comes from algae. And one can take these algae that respond to light, they use this to find out where the sun is, um, and put this into a brain cell, shine a blue light on the brain cell, and the brain cell will fire. Who knew that was an algae? Um, and so we needed this basic research into algae to know this before we could actually use the proteins. The same with the fluorescent proteins. Um, we don't have time to take this call, but I'm going to just read the question um, here. Um, someone wants to know, uh, can you use GFP to measure risk of modifying cells? What is the impact? To find the risk of modifying. Can you measure the risk of modifying cells? What's the impact? So uh, I, I think the interesting thing is, uh, like I said, it's like putting a light bulb at the end of a protein. Uh, and that might change the protein. There might be some risk to that. But the problem is whenever somebody uses GFP in an experiment, if it works, it's published. If it doesn't work, then it's not published. So in many cases, it probably doesn't work and there probably is a small risk to it. But we never know about it because there's no incentive to publish something that didn't work. Well, I want to thank Dr. Mark Zimmer again. He is a professor of chemistry at Connecticut College in New London. Uh, we'll look forward to your new book coming out January 1st. Tell us again the title. It's Lightening Up the Brain, the Science of Optogenetics. I want to thank you for giving us a glimpse into, the, again, this very powerful tool being used in research uh, in many labs. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. And thank you for having me here. It's been I great. also want to mention again, uh, go to Where We Live's Facebook page. Right after the show, we're going to have a Facebook Live with Dr. Mark Zimmer and our producer for today, uh, Carmen Baskoff. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks also to our technical producer, Kion Wolf. WMPR's executive producer is Katie Tolarski. Special thanks to Lydia Brown. As always, thanks for listening.